from the heart of where innovation, money, and power collide. In Silicon Valley and beyond, this is Bloomberg Technology with Emily Chang. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco, and this is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up in the next hour, U.S. stocks climbing to an all-time high after surprisingly weak jobs data. We're going to break down how the tech sector fared. Plus, imagine an online world without passwords. Google is doing just that, working towards a passwordless future. And the search giant says it will be a safer, more secure future, too. And could Elon Musk's Saturday Night Live appearance move markets? Doge traders are organizing taco-filled watch parties as the one-time Joe cryptocurrency has delivered astonishing returns for some traders. All those stories in a moment, but first, U.S. stocks climbing to a record after that surprisingly weak jobs report erased ease fears about higher inflation and a cutback in stimulus. Let's get the full markets picture with Kriti Gupta and our Ed Ludlow. Kriti, let's start with you. Well, Emily, you hit it. You really saw that disappointment in the payrolls report. The immediate reaction was tech outperformance. However, that really changed as we went throughout the day. However, all 11 sectors ending in the green. You can really see it right here. The S&P 500 higher tech underperforming, but still in the green. That, like you said, was flipped in pre-market trading. Even small caps outperforming. So once again, that trade, that buy the dip trade, coming in strong today. And of course, you have semiconductors, which were under pressure this week, making a little bit of a comeback. Flip up the boards. I want to talk about crypto because we have to talk about crypto. We've been talking about Ethereum, just making these massive percentage moves. But take a look at the volume compared to Bitcoin. Bitcoin, this white line, Ethereum down in blue. So Bitcoin still has that major market cap hold. Flip up the board one more time. And I want to go to the other parts of the tech sector because I did say we had a broad rally, but that didn't necessarily hit every part of the stock market, just those 11 sectors. So like I said, flip up the board. And I want to show you those Chinese ADRs flat on the day did take a bigger hit intraday. Looks like it paired back in the last few minutes of trading. NASDAQ Biotech's in the green. And of course, that outperformance, those electric vehicles really taking a massive rally there as well. Let's see if that continues into next week. Ed, what are you looking at? Yeah, so investors now more relaxed about inflation concerns. They put on pause their concerns that stimulus would be paired back. So it's no surprise that the biggest points movers in the S&P 500 are your big tech names. Apple, Microsoft, Alphabet, and NVIDIA. All those companies also, by the way, have already reported. They're the ones with the stretch valuations that we saw concerns around when yields were rising. But there is the earnings story that's going on. Yeah, big tech's out the way. There are other stories out there. Match. Dot com online dating it actually reported earnings on Wednesday but it's surging on Friday still seeing momentum the story here is that the pandemic reopening is putting people together they are in love they're going out for dinners that they couldn't do during the pandemic and there's some momentum in that stock you see up almost four and a half percent on Friday similar story with Roblox Roblox is reporting earnings on Monday but it had its price target and uh, a buy initi uh, coverage initiated at Lightshed a price target of $85 and they're talking about how Roblox is the example of how investors can participate in this new trend of digital interaction, not just playing video games, but socializing at the same time, creating video games. These are all really nice themes. Finally, got to talk about electric vehicles. Nikola, you know Nikola, the company with the, the chairman that had to resign, subject to an SEC investigation. Anyway, they had earnings. No news. No news is good news for this stock because if we change the boards up, it was up more than 12% on Friday. Investors, a sigh of relief there that nothing bad happened with that company. And finally, Tesla. I want to talk a little bit about Tesla. Why? No reason, really. Elon Musk hosting Saturday Night Live. We'll talk about it a little bit more. Emily. All right. Ed Ludlow, love the conviction there. And our Kriti Gupta, thank you both. Now, it was not the jobs day we were expecting with estimates so widely off. And of course, economic voices on the topic were abundant. I believe we will reach full employment next year. But today's numbers also show 
that we're not yet finished. For all those people who've been saying, oh my gosh, the Fed needs to normalize quantitative easing, today's jobs report is just an example of we have a long way to go. More people looked for jobs in the month of April than the previous month. So we're seeing positive signs as we continue to move forward here. The labor market can only recover so much as we are truly able to address the full scope of the public health crisis. The scale of the numbers that we're looking at, the gross inflows and outflows are unprecedented. Is it demand or is it more likely that it is supply? We're still seeing stronger growth in sectors that weren't necessarily where the job losses initially were. For more perspective on the market reaction and how the tech sector has responded on the day, we're joined by Mark Mahaney of Evercore ISI. So Mark, what's your read and interpretation on this job report and what it means for big tech? Well, for tech across the board, uh, which includes a lot of high growth speculative names where their value is in kind of the terminal value of the DCF or the earnings really come in the out years, rising interest rates are a negative. And then when you have a day like today, which makes you think that interest rates may not rise so rapidly, it's a positive for that group. So uh, tech now has got a pretty broad range of kind of enterprise legacy tech to kind of premium high quality growth tech. That's where kind of the FANG names would fall in. And then you still have your speculative names. Uh, the, the big trade today was uh, uh, inflation risks cooled off. Now I can get it safer to buy those high growth, uh, more speculative uh, uh, tech names. And you would expect this trade every single time this job numbers comes out. The question is which whether we're gonna have a positive or a negative surprise. How much growth in jobs do you see happening in the tech sector? in particular as we come out of the pandemic, knowing that tech in general has fared better than basically any other sector. Uh, Emily, I think you're, I think you're actually, what you just said is absolutely uh, right. There were some structural winners in tech uh, from the COVID crisis. That sounds crass, but it is true. Uh, some of these companies have had or have higher growth rates, like the big super tech names that reported last week. I'm not sure about Apple, but Microsoft almost certainly, Google, yes, Facebook, yes, Amazon, yes. They're all growing faster, not because of COVID, but because of all the conditions around this last year. Their growth rates are faster. So they're going to be the biggest employers. Uh, they're going to be hiring, adding the most people, particularly Amazon. I think it added four to 500,000 next year. I think that number this year is going to be two to 300,000. Very different types of employers than some of the other employees and some of the other uh, firms will be adding. But yes, there's going to be a lot of uh, employment growth uh, out of tech, and it's a good thing. So, you know, we are coming out of big tech earnings. I believe we are almost uh, near the end. And generally, companies have performed well. If you look at the FANG stocks, again, surprising us, it seems like digital advertising is back. What are some of the highlights to you? Well, what I find interesting is that digital advertising is definitely back instead of a U-shaped recovery or a V-shaped recovery. Internet advertising was a checkmark shape recovery, i.e. growth rates uh, in the December quarter and then the March quarter we just printed, they were faster than what we had pr prior to COVID. And I think one of the big uh, things that's really happened here, and to me, one of the biggest new insights that I've had is it's that dramatic growth we've had in new business formation. We've had greater growth in new business formation in the last nine months than we've had in decades. Uh, it just, you know, it, COVID unfortunately destroyed small businesses. COVID then turned it out and created a lot of small businesses. And all of those businesses pay their utility bills and they start their marketing campaigns. And where did they start them now? Today in 2021, they started them on Google and they started them on Facebook. Those two companies have been major beneficiaries and it's powering a lot of internet advertising growth. The, the one company that didn't have acceleration was Twitter and that stock's been taken down. What about Amazon? You cover Amazon as well and they're moving Prime Day forward in order to possibly catch, uh, continue to catch some of that pandemic demand. But uh, the general belief, belief is that as we get later on in the year, the year over year comps will not look as good. What is your outlook? Yeah, no, you're, you're right. Uh, you're going to have, uh, they, they're entering into tougher comps. What's so interesting now about Amazon is they gave their guidance for the June quarter. The market knew that the March quarter was going to be really strong. The question was, what was the June quarter outlook? eBay gave you guidance that said now their retail sales are going to decline year over year. Amazon is essentially saying that they can sustain the same sort of growth rate that they've had uh, Pre-COVID, in fact, they're going to grow a little bit faster. COVID, even on really tough comps, that tells you how much of a structural winner they've been. But in terms of the stocks, we had these big mega cap blowout earnings, and the stocks didn't really move. 
And to me, I think the market is sort of waiting until we can focus on 2022, because right now, this is the peak GDP quarter, uh, because the cops hey, were so easy last year. Yes. Mark, I got to jump in here because we are right now watching a uh, surprising press conference at the White House. This is uh, President Biden's job cabinet coming out and speaking to reporters on the back of this disappointing jobs report. They've just come out of a meeting with the president. So, um, of course, in his jobs cabinet, we've got uh, Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg, Marty Walsh. Secretary of Labor Jennifer Granholm, Secretary of Energy Gina Raimondo, Commerce Secretary and Marsha Fudd in Housing and Urban Development. Obviously, this jobs report was a huge shock to the markets today, a big miss, one of the biggest misses in decades. Mark, you know, when something like this happens, when, you know, it's not just a miss, but it is a big and unexpected miss, does that cause uh, a greater feeling of unsettlement across the industry? I mean, nobody likes surprises. And I wonder if that makes companies in general sort of question the risks they're taking. Well, I think you're right, Emily. I, I'm sure it does. I'm sure this kind of volatility is, is it's hard for business planners to figure out what their capital expenditure budget should be, what their uh, hiring budgets uh, should be. It is just one data point. I mean, these numbers can be squirrely from time to time. And I think the overall read, at least from the tech sector, is going to be, you know, we are recovering. Uh, demand is recovering. Demand in the end markets is recovering. Even some of the weakest uh, parts of the economy, hospitality and tourism and automotive, those areas are recovering. The question is just the pace at which it recovers, not whether it's going to recover or not. So, yes, there's, there's uncertainty here. But the general direction, I think most people agree on, and that, uh, you know, we'll have uh, increasing recoveries to go through the year. I wonder if, too, tech is in a unique position because you're seeing more companies allow people to work from home. So the big concern has been, you know, when there is this return to the office, some people aren't going to want to return to the office. Google looked like they were going to take a stricter line on this, but just came out this week saying, actually, we are going to let our employees work in a hybrid mode. Mark Zuckerberg has very much embraced this idea. How does that change the jobs dynamic for Silicon Valley? Well, um, you know, one real direct insight is Silicon Valley as a geographic center may become less important. Uh, if uh, if employees can work remotely, that doesn't mean they have to work from San Francisco. That means that doesn't mean they can negate the San Francisco to Palo Alto commute. That means they can uh, they can think about a Boise to to Palo Alto commute. I.e., you can now uh, these jobs can be much more remotely located than they were in the past. I, I could see that at some level reducing the um, the appeal of uh, of San Francisco the Silicon Valley real estate. Um, that, I don't know if that's a good or a bad thing. I think that's just a reality, especially as work from home and some sort of hybrid work from home, work from office becomes much more prevalent. All right, uh, Mark Mahaney of Evercore, always good to have you here on the show and appreciate that wide-ranging perspective, still uncertain times, even though we are inching back closer to new normal. We've been listening in to this uh, gaggle at the White House. Um, Gina Raimondo, uh, Commerce uh, Secretary, has just mentioned that in the meeting with the president, they talked about the broadband and the CHIPS Act. But again, um, President Biden's job cap jobs cabinet speaking to reporters right now on the back of this very disappointing jobs report, which has caused a lot of unrest and definitely impacted the markets today. We're going to continue to listen in to this press conference and bring you more headlines as we have them. Meantime, coming up, Expedia CEO Peter Kern on the company's positive earnings outlook amid signs the travel industry is on a rebound and why he disagrees with Airbnb CEO Brian Chesky next. This is Bloomberg. Cities will come roaring back. It's just a question of opening and, and cities being able to be what the cities were. You know, it's, it's not that interesting to go to, a, to go to New York if you can't go to a restaurant or the theater or a museum. But when you can, it's New York. Travel on the rebound. Earlier, I spoke with Expedia CEO Peter Kern about the company's positive earnings results and why he thinks travel to major cities and beyond will come roaring back. 
we uh, we're just leaning into that. You know, our hosts make more than they do on any other platform. And uh, since the pandemic started, uh, on average, new hosts have made uh, more than ten thousand dollars. So, uh, you know, that's a really attractive proposition. And when people understand our proposition, uh, it's not hard to get them across. So uh, we're just marketing more. We're getting that message out more. And as we lean in more broadly to the Verbo brands and other brands around the globe in our strongest markets, uh, we have in, uh, been gaining share in our strongest markets. And, uh, and that is a kind of virtuous cycle that gets us more hosts because they can monetize their properties better. And uh, that just keeps going. So we're just leaning into both sides of that. And uh, so far, so good. It's been very good this year. Peter, everyone wants more color about how that competition with Airbnb is shaking out. At this point, how big is Verbo as a total piece of the overall Expedia pie? You know, we don't break it out because, uh, frankly, we have a, a broader vision for it, which is not just that it remains a standalone brand, but that we can continue to drive vacation rentals through all our online travel brands and, frankly, through all our B2B partners. We have many B2B partners around the globe, and our, and our vision is that we are going to drive vacation rentals through all those touch points. And by doing that, we will have reached that really nobody else has in terms of how they can drive vacation rentals. So that is our vision for it. And that's why we don't get too caught up breaking out Verbo as Verbo. Vacation rentals is a strong part of our business. And certainly Verbo has had a great year. But as we continue to evolve the product, make it easier for shoppers to get vacation rentals on our core OTA brands like Expedia and Hotels.com. Uh, and when we drive it through our B2B partners, uh, that's just going to open up just a, a larger addressable universe. And I think something really exciting that no one else can provide to a homeowner. So you're seeing a rebound at beaches, at outdoor destinations. When do cities come back? When does international come back? Because Brian Chesky, Airbnb CEO, is pretty adamant that uh, travel to national parks and more regional destinations is here to stay. Yeah, well, I, I, I love Brian, but I disagree with him on this one. I think cities will come roaring back. It's just a question of opening and, and cities being able to be what the cities were. You know, it's, it's not that interesting to go to, to go to New York if you can't go to a restaurant or the theater or a museum. But when you can, it's New York. And uh, as far as I know, New York announced their opening in a couple of weeks, which is really exciting. Chicago's talking about the same. Uh, you know, hopefully the main major cities of Europe will be open. So I think it's just a question of all the attraction of those places coming back and the openness. And when those are open, people are dying to go to those places. I'm sure you have many friends who would love to get back to Europe. It's not to necessarily to go to the countryside. It's to go to Paris or Rome or London. Um, so I, I think that's that will be true. I think national parks are great. I go to them. Uh, but uh, I think people know about national parks. And I think people will want to get back to cities. So I, I think it's just a question of opening. It's just a question of comfort. Um, and whether, you know, some of them will be back soon. Miami's a big city and it's, it's packed right now. Uh, but New York, Chicago, San Francisco, places like that, Seattle, where I am, you know, it, it will take longer. But once they open, uh, I think people will come uh, roaring back to them. So uh, I'm, I'm excited for that. That's going to be the next leg of our recovery journey is major cities around the world and international travel being open again. Now, when we last spoke, business travel was the one big question mark that you still had. Would that recover? You are selling your corporate travel unit to American Express. What business travel activity are you actually seeing, and what do you think happens to business travel in the end? Yeah, well, I've, I've said all along, I think business travel will be back. I, I, I've done some interviews where I said as soon as the first you know, salesman gets on a plane and goes and sells something that the one who stayed home didn't, we're going to see everybody back zooming around the world. And I think that's basically true. Uh, we did, we are planning potentially to sell uh, our corporate business, but that's really an investment in the future of corporate. We think that corporate combination makes the best company in the corporate space that we can be part of and an owner of. Uh, and by doing that, we simplify our own company so we can focus on our core businesses of powering B2B customers and, and powering our B2C brands. And our B2B business is a big push for us. And this is a big addition to our B2B business. So it really fits into our long-term strategy and it allows that corporate enterprise to focus on corporate clients. But we believe they'll be back. We believe that will be a thriving business again. It may take a little longer, uh, but it's, it's definitely coming back.
Our interview there earlier with Expedia Vice Chair and CEO Peter Kern. You can catch the full interview at Bloomberg.com. Coming up, a Chinese insurance tech firm pulled off a U.S. IPO this year, even amid policy crackdowns and industry overhauls. We're going to hear from the co-founder of Waterdrop next. This is Bloomberg. Waterdrop, a Tencent-backed insurance tech firm, opened 15% below its IPO price in its market debut. Ahead of the company's IPO, co-founder Guang Yang spoke with Bloomberg TV about the initial pricing of the stock and regulatory risk. We are leading a Chinese uh, insurtech platform. We are so far the, uh, the second largest uh, online insurance distribution platform in China, uh, following just and insurance. Uh, and we are confident in the uh, prospect of the, uh, the company's uh, strategy and the growth uh, perspectives. So uh, uh, we believe the, uh, the stock price will, uh, uh, will reflect the, uh, the potential of the company. And we are qu uh, quite confident in the, uh, the future development of the company. So you're betting on the potential, how far down the road until you reach that potential? Because right now, there's lots of regulatory uncertainty in China in the space that you do business. And let's face it, you've not been profitable yet. Uh, I think the, uh, the recent regulatory uh, remediation are more uh, fintech related and tailored to end insurance. And, and I think, but we are an insure tech company and we are not, uh, uh, we, are, we operate all our uh, business activities in compliance with the uh, uh, regulatory framework. So we are, I think the, uh, the recent regulatory uh, change will not affect the, to the current business of the company. Are you concerned or how concerned are you that the United States under the Biden administration is going to continue their scrutiny of U.S. Uh, listed Chinese companies and that there's always the potential? I'm not saying you are under scrutiny, but there's always the potential uh, that Chinese companies could be investigated and eventually delisted. That uh, must concern you. We can't comment on the uh, U.S. regulatory uh, process, uh, and, but we are confident in the uh, prospect of our business strategy and whether probably can due to as a publicly uh, listed company. When do you plan to be profitable? Because I was just looking at some of the numbers. Uh, we had a net loss of 101.7 million U.S. dollars in 2020. That's about double what it was in 2019. Obviously, you're growing the business, so there's more costs at that time. But when can you tell investors as you go public, when are you going to be profitable, sir? It is still a, a little bit early to predict uh, future uh, profitability, but uh, we believe we are on the right track uh, to strengthen our profitability as we firmly uh, execute our growth uh, strategies. The co-founder of Waterdrop there, Guang Yang, with Stephen Engel. Coming up, Elon Musk and SNL will tell you everything you need to know. This is Bloomberg. Hi, I'm Elon Musk, and I'm hosting SNL This Week with musical guest Miley Cyrus. And I'm a wild card to this no telling what I might do. Same here. Rules, no thing. But it's also the Mother's Day show, so your moms are going to be here. Oh, forget what I said. Fine, we'll be good-ish. <laughs> Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. Yes, you heard it right. Elon Musk hosting SNL This Weekend with Miley Cyrus. Musk even asked for suggestions of what to do with his sketches on Twitter, ever the master of his own publicity. Joining me to discuss are Ed Ludlow, who I know will be tuned in along with yours truly. Still wondering, Ed, about Musk's comic timing. I guess we'll see. But the real story is Doge, a huge run up and all of these Doge watch parties planned for this particular SNL. What's going on? This is the least subtle walk up to an SNL of all time. He's tweeted multiple times references to Dogecoin, called himself the Doge father, put up multiple memes. And all you have to do is look at a chart of Dogecoin activity since SNL announced that Elon Musk was hosting. And you can see what people think of it. It's been on absolute tear. And this is a cryptocurrency that started basically as a joke. What, what's important here, and if you read the serious analyst notes and you take this a little bit seriously, SNL is broadcast to everyday Americans and globally. 
So it's putting this cryptocurrency in particular right in the, the front rooms, the living rooms, the TV sets of everyday Americans. And it's got Elon Musk at the center. Well, they talked about it there in the promo. Elon Musk notoriously doesn't like rules. Neither does Miley Cyrus. I wonder what he could do that would surprise us. I think if you're an investor in Tesla, you have half an eye on this, a little concerned. Remember when Elon did the Joe Rogan podcast back in 2018, the following day, Tesla stock closed down 6%. So there is a serious side to this. He is the CEO of an S&P 500 company, but he doesn't stick to the script. Just think about earnings calls. Think about Battery Day uh, last year, where Elon Musk just went off script. You know, he has a propensity to say things that perhaps he shouldn't as an executive of a publicly traded company, but he just doesn't behave in a normal fiduciary or company director way. But that's what makes him accessible. That's why he has the cult following, and that's why there's so, so much intense interest in him hosting Saturday, Saturday Night Live. Will he be any good at it? we we'll have to wait and see. He tweeted again just about 10 minutes ago. Um, talk to us about the promotion, self-promotion that's gone into this. Look, Elon Musk is an active user of Twitter. He engages with Tesla owners, people that actually own the cars. He really understands the people that he's talking to. Remember, Tesla does not advertise in the traditional way. In fact, in last year's annual filing, they didn't even disclose how much they spent on advertising because it was negligible. He knows what he's doing. He likes to put himself front and center. He's got in trouble with regulators in the past. He's got in trouble with his own attorneys. But he does it. He pushes the boundaries of what a CEO is expected to do. And what's so fascinating in 2021, look at the CEO of Volkswagen. Look at Jim Farley at Ford. How active are they on Twitter now, following in his example? You know, he's really changed the perception of what a CEO should be. Is he going to be a good TV host? I don't know. But I'm certainly going to tune in and find out. We're watching him dancing right now at some prior Tesla unveiling. And I, I got to admit, it makes you laugh. You know, he's... He is funny, Ed, on Twitter. He has good comic timing on Twitter. But do you think he can pull it off on the SNL stage? I mean, some of the most celebrated actors go on SNL, and it's just OK. You know, Elon Musk uh, is a man of many talents. What he's achieved with SpaceX and Tesla is obviously incredible. Uh, on earnings calls, he's not the clearest speaker. He does mumble from time to time. He's very good, though, at getting people excited and looking to the horizon. He's very good at promising things. Does he always deliver? Sometimes his timelines of his company are off. But we'll give him the benefit of the doubt, and he's got Miley Cyrus to back him up. All right. We'll be watching, along with a lot of other people, Bloomberg's Ed Ludlow. Thanks so much for that roundup. OK. Changing topics. How many times have you forgotten a password and had to click reset or tried and tried until you're locked out? Google says it is on a quest to change that. The search giant has announced they plan to move towards a password free future where you'll no longer need to worry about a series of digits and special characters to access the company's platform. But in the meantime, Google also plans to have every user use two factor authentication unless you opt out, which means not only will you need a password, but also a unique code sent to your email, phone, or other device to then authenticate that password in order to log in. Joining me for more, Mark Risher, Google Director of Product Management for Identity and User Security, who is heading this initiative. So, Mark, there is no question that we're all tired of passwords. Is a passwordless future really around the corner? It really is around the corner. The, the, the stars are aligning now to get uh, devices. You know, now everyone has a phone in their pocket that allows for much, much stronger authentication than just relying on, you know, your kid's middle name spelled backwards. So when we get to that future, and often it's a lot more complicated than your kid's middle name spelled backwards, how will it work? Sometimes how do we get out. rid of passwords altogether? <laughs> So how do we, yeah, I was saying sometimes you swap out the S for a dollar sign if you're, if you're very fancy. Um, how do we get there? The way we do it is by relying on these devices and basically moving from signing in every app every time that you need to access it to setting up a device like your phone that's in your pocket and that you know already is locked down with your fingerprint or your face and then using that to securely authenticate with the different sites. So Google is sort of in this moment trying to get us halfway there. What exactly are you doing and how do you get us 
to the final destination that we all so desire? Well, we're on a, a few steps of the journey. The first part is how do you sign into Google and making sure that that is absolutely secure. And that's where the announcement now that we're moving to automatically enroll people in a two-step or two-factor authentication should really, really improve the security and the protection of your Google account. And then the second part is for all the other sites and apps you use, we've been heavily investing in making Chrome, our web browser, and Android automatically fill the passwords for you. And we've actually extended that to iPhones as well. If you install Chrome on your iPhone, there again, it automatically suggests strong passwords and fills it in for you. Combined with this means is that you're in a much, much better protected state and it should be fairly transparent for users. They shouldn't have to worry about it. It shouldn't feel painful or like an inconvenience. Instead, the security just works by default automatically on your behalf. Are there any drawbacks to going passwordless and to having this all stored in one sort of central place? You know, sometimes people think like, do I want to put all my eggs in one basket? That's the most common metaphor or analogy that we hear. But the issue is actually you want to put your eggs in the best defended place. And I think Fort Knox or a bank is a better metaphor saying, you know, you could spread stuff all around, but it's actually better to pick a place where you've focused explicitly on locking it down and on security. That's why, as I said, we're making your Google account secure by default automatically with the strongest security that's available, and then tying autofill or these other capabilities to that. So you've got many, many layers of protection that do give you that best, safest, and also streamlined experience. Mark, you've been working in this area at Google for many, many years, and I'm just curious how you're looking at the cyber landscape right now. We have seen the most pernicious hacks in history. The attackers are getting faster. They're getting better. How would you describe the threat level right now? The threat level is absolutely elevated. There's more and more people trying, more and more of these bad actors. And frankly, there's more to lose. As we bring an increasing amount of our lives online, attacks and, and you know, online digital hacks can be much more dangerous and much more pernicious. That's why what we're focused on is what are the places that most people are vulnerable and how do we take the biggest chunk out of that? You know, there's a lot of headlines about these scary, what they call zero day attacks where somebody can you know, go right after the CPU inside your computer. Those are real, those are scary, but far, far more likely and far more dangerous in aggregate is going after your authentication. So phishing, hacking into somebody's account and impersonating them, being able to then access all the materials as if you were them, much more dangerous, much cheaper for the attackers to bring on. And so that's one of the areas that we're focused on with this, uh, this announcement today. Meantime, the U.S. and the U.K. today released information about Russia's foreign intelligence service and their hackers breaching email to find passwords and other information to further infiltrate or other organizations. What is Google doing to protect its users against this? There again, it's about taking those secure credentials and locking them down in an explicit vault designed for it. And so the Google Password Manager built into Chrome, built into Android, and available on iOS as well, gives you that strong security, gives you that central place. You can also use the Google Security Checkup, g.co slash security checkup, to verify the protections on your account, to make sure that everything's in a good state, to make sure that there's no recent suspicious activity or devices that you maybe sold on eBay and then forgot to sign out of. All of that's bundled together in that g.co slash security checkup. And together, what that does is put people into the best protected place where there's just much less surface area for the attackers to go after. Meantime, Google, along with many other companies, is becoming more flexible about letting employees work from home, work from anywhere. And I know that this is a massive security challenge for all companies. You know, what is Google doing to protect its own employees and all of this, you know, critical and privileged information that you have, and can Google, in fact, protect all of that information as well when employees are dispersed? That has been a priority for us for quite some time. We have an initiative at Google we called Beyond Corp, which many years ago moved us away from 
a VPN or from assuming that everyone would plug into a cable right there in the office building to saying the thing that we care about authenticating is the person and the device. So with our Beyond Corp, which now actually we've packaged up to sell to enterprises and businesses, it allows that secure connection wherever you are in the world. We already didn't trust the network. And so when the coronavirus pandemic began and people were working from home, it made it relatively easy for us to do that, in part because we rely on technology like security keys, something that we helped invent many years ago, that provide the strongest protection against password phishing and the types of credential attacks that I mentioned earlier. All right, Mark Risher of Google, Director of Product Management, Identity and User Security. Fascinating stuff. I can't wait for that passwordless future myself. Thank you. Coming up, meal kit delivery company, Blue Apron. Wedding investors appetites after its latest financial quarter. We're gonna to talk to President and CEO, Linda Finley Klozlowski, next. This is Bloomberg. Meal kit pioneer Blue Apron reporting a strong first quarter this week, but as vaccines roll out and diners roll in to restaurants, just how long will the home cooking boom last? Let's get to Blue Apron president and CEO Linda Finley Kozlowski, who joins us now live. And Linda, you're seeing a lot of interesting trends. We're in this sort of messy middle period right now where we're still home, but we're starting to venture out. What trends do you see and do you expect to see in your business as a result of this new transformation? Well, actually, I think that's the really fun part about watching the data on this is we can very clearly see as different states opened up and as different travel trends were happening, we can watch our own data and understand exactly what behaviors um, are being driven by some of those moves. And a big part of what we've seen is, while there is, of course, as you would expect when people travel or people start going back out again, um, you know, a, a little bit of a, a you know, a reduction in maybe order rate, what we are seeing is some of those strong value metrics that we put out in this quarter and have been putting out quarter after quarter as we've grown our, um, our average revenue per customer 22% year over year into Q1 um, to $331 a customer. Those patterns are holding steady where people are still spending more, people are still cooking at home and you're seeing what I would call more normal trends around travel actually coming back in, but that's fine because they're they're on the backs of something that's a much higher value customer than what you were looking at before because we've tried to engage people with those valuable products. Interesting. You are also adding a slew of new products, add-ons, meaning you can add an appetizer, dessert yep. aside to a meal. You've got these butcher bundles, high-end burgers. You've got a partnership with Roy Yamaguchi, the famous chef from my home state of Hawaii. How much do you think these new things will really drive the business? Well, it's actually a really critical part of our strategy. We said early on that we were going to focus first on evolving the product to drive more new value into our customer base. So we wanna make sure that every customer we're providing maximum value to them and that they'll stay around longer, that we can engage them in multiple products. And then we could build marketing and growth engines for, um, you know, for acquisition on top of that because it, it becomes a lot more efficient. And so honestly, these products are really just a result of listening to our customers and what they want and what they expect to get from Blue Apron. And so things like the butcher bundle and being able to provide proteins that you can grill through the summer or elevated burgers, people already love our burgers, but now they'll have you know that restaurant quality choice of um, a burger they might wanna have at home on the weekend. All of those things just further engage customers and help them find different things each week that interest them and in something that keeps them coming back for more. Meantime, you know, I know supplies, the supply chain has been so disrupted and also kind of a fascinating study in experimentation. Are you seeing an increase in raw materials in, you know, the foods that make this happen? And how do you deal with that going forward? Yeah, I think we're seeing a little bit of an interesting balance now. So, you know, we continue to see that the logistics uh, chains are really, really stretched. And, and so there's a lot of cost fluctuations there. But again, one of the things that makes Blue Apron unique is we have a direct sourcing model. So 70% of what we put into the box comes directly from the producers. 
We source very high quality ingredients. Um, so we're sourcing from a very elevated supply chain. And we have really long and good relationships with our suppliers. So we're making sure that we stay really close with them and manage those relationships really carefully. So we've been able to balance those two things off of each other to make sure that we can still deliver very high quality at a reasonable value. Um, I think the more interesting aspect of it too is because of those tight relationships with suppliers, we're really able to reduce food waste using a Blue Apron boxes, 25% lower carbon footprint than going to the grocery store. And so the fact that we can keep food waste down both in our facility and in your home means we can also manage that supply chain a lot more tightly and keep prices reasonable. Interesting. All right. Uh, well, well, fascinating to see all the new moves you're making. Linda Finley Kozlowski, president and CEO of Blue Apron. Good to have you back here on the show. All right, coming up, recent sports betting legalization in Michigan and Virginia helping to boost DraftKings Q1 revenue. We're going to talk to CEO Jason Robbins next. This is Bloomberg. Sports betting company DraftKings raising its 2021 revenue guidance and topping analyst expectations. The betting operator also announcing a new social offering for bets. Our Caroline Hyde spoke to DraftKings CEO Jason Robbins asking how sustainable the growth rate will be as the world returns to normal. I think, you know, we really are, are seeing nothing but incredible momentum in the business right now. And I think, you know, sports being back in full swing is driving a lot of that. I think general momentum in the industry is. Uh, we have a packed sports calendar um, the next several months. You know, a lot of the uh, NBA and NHL, for example, pushing their starts back a little bit this year means we'll be playing, you know, they'll be playing playoff games well into, you know, late Q2 and early Q3. So should be an exciting next few months. And then we also have a lot of live legislation. Uh, almost two dozen states are actively considering mobile yeah. sports we, uh, wagering legislation. Another four are considering iGaming legislation. So a lot of great momentum on that front, too. Uh, can, can you talk a little bit more about some of the legislation? We've been obviously keeping an eye uh, on some of these various states and, and the progress that they've been making. Um, where do you see uh, how soon we, we get some of, the, uh, some of this legislation actually passed and signed into uh, state law? Well, I think, you know, it's hard to predict exactly what pace the states move at, but most of them are done with their sessions around middle of, uh, of the year. So um, there are several that do have sessions that extend through the rest of the year, uh, including Ohio and Illinois. So um, those might be a little bit later. But I think uh, a lot of the things, you know, for example, in Illinois also get done ahead of the budget time, which I believe is in May. So. There's definitely natural points at which we may or may not see something happen, but um, very hard to predict exact timing. I do uh, feel very excited that several states have already moved forward with legislation this year. Those include, you know, Wyoming, Arizona, of course, New York. Maryland has passed a bill that's awaiting the governor's signature. Good momentum in other states like Louisiana. So lots of great things happening, and uh, hopefully we'll have an, an exciting next few months with getting some of these bills over the line. Yeah, Jason, given the exciting next few months that you mentioned and, of course, raising that full year guidance, what do you think investors are missing today? Uh, I can't really comment on how, you know, short term trading in the market goes. I, every time I try to explain it, I find I'm just wasting brain cells. So we continue to focus on making sure that we have a great long term strategy. Uh, creating a great product and experience for our customers, executing really well, and then consistent, uh, consistently delivering or over-delivering on the expectations that we set. And I think companies that do that generally perform well over time. And uh, I think you kind of drive yourself crazy trying to figure out what drives something up or down one day. Um, you know, we had a pretty good earnings release, and I can't really find anything that I would point to that we weren't excited and thrilled about. I think we beat expectations along all fronts. but. You know, the market's a funny thing, and, uh, you know, I found it just kind of kills brain cells and distracts from really the most important thing, which is focusing on the long term and focusing on executing and consistently beating expectations. Um, well, your shares were up, what, 200 percent or so in the markets in 2020. So uh, we'll, we'll look at the days gy gyrations, years gyrations. But in terms of the growth trajectory for you, Jason, and also whether it's organic or inorganic, you've done some M&A, of course, VSIN, Blue Ribbon software. Are you still going to be making purchases, do you think? 
You know, we're always opportunistically evaluating things. There's a lot of activity in the market right now. Um, you know, I think we feel very good that we don't need to do anything. So it really is about if something that's interesting, that fits strategically, that is at the right value, uh, comes along. And I think if that's the case, we'll be opportunistic. And if not, we'll be patient and, um, you know, just continue to kind of execute against a disciplined strategy of uh, going after value where we see it. and. Uh, not doing things that we think aren't at the right value or don't fit strategically. Yeah. And, um, you know, like I said, I think if you looked at a year and change ago, we felt like we really needed to own our own sports betting technology. That was kind of a must have, and that's why we did the acquisition of SB Tech in, uh, you know, last, uh, early last year. Um, I don't think we feel that way now. I think we feel like we have all the pieces and that, you know, certainly there are things we could have a build versus buy analysis on, but there's nothing that we feel like we absolutely must acquire at this point. DraftKings chair and CEO Jason Robbins there. We're going to hear more from him and other Boston area business leaders, including those in biotech and life sciences next week in our Boston special that is happening Tuesday. Do not miss it right here on Bloomberg Technology. And that does it for the show today. Up next, Bloomberg's Wall Street Week with my colleague David Weston, joined by Larry Summers and Sam Zell.